Welcome back to AXA Coral Live. Uh, a very big welcome back to the Kamabi Research Station here in Curaçao. And it's wonderful to welcome Dr. Pim Boghas to uh, Coral Live. Uh, Pim and I first met each other on Heron Island about five, six years ago. That's right. Um, when uh, we were both working on the Exo Catlin Sea View Survey. Yeah. Um, so great, great to, to see you again. Um, just before we, we start and have a chat, and, and really looking forward to hearing more about what you're up to currently, um, just to welcome schools um, in Nigeria, Portugal, the UK, Romania, Switzerland, India, Thailand, Canada, uh, and Egypt um, to the call this morning. So wow. good range there. And we've got some special shout outs. Um, we've got our ladies um, school in Abingdon in England. Hi there. Welcome. Uh, Springside Primary in North Ayrshire in Scotland and welcome to you too. Hi. Uh, we've got uh, Shrewsbury International School in Bangkok wow. with us. <laughs> and uh, lastly, uh, we've got Woodhouse Primary School um, in England. If there are any other classes who are joining us and would we'll like a shout out, we'll try and get through some more um, just in a little bit. Um, Pim, I'm just going to put this in a, in a pocket so we don't get that in the drink. Safely. Yeah. Safely. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about you know, your work. You're, you're now at the California Academy of Sciences. You have been um, doing a lot of research on the, on the deep reef um, and meaning sort of between sort of 40 and 80 meters. Is that, is yeah, that that's right? right. Yeah. Before we get to, 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 to those important things, just for our audiences watching, can we go through some coral basics? Yeah, yeah, if, of if, if yeah. that's okay. No problem. Um, I've got, got I've, got, I've got some coral skeletons here. Yeah. Um, could you tell us what coral is? <laughs> yeah. Well, so the most important thing to know about coral is that it's not just a rock, right? It's a living animal. And okay. This looks like a rock pretty much, right? But the thing is that this is just the skeleton of the coral. And so there's this thin layer of tissue uh, that's on top of this skeleton that's actually the living animal. And that's what deposits this rock or calcium carbonate. Um, Amazing. So I know we have this type of coral growing just here or on the jetty, and yeah. I don't know, um, Ellie, whether we can cut, cut to that. Um, and just because it's not white yeah. um, when it's alive. So what's, what's going on there? No, exactly. And it's sort of similarly, you know, like our skeletons are sort of white and look very different from when we're alive. Similarly with corals, if they die off, you just get this, this skeleton, which is bright white. But in all reality, the, the tissue layer that's on top of it, that is a coral animal, is packed with these tiny symbiotic algae that are brown and that photosynthesize and that gives it sort of a brown color and then there's all these other kind of pigments that can protect the coral against sun or can actually transform different wavelengths of light and they give it all the different bright colors um, and that's why they look very different from this white color um. so it's sort of like those plant-like colors because al algae that that lives inside its tissue yeah it's, it's basically plant-like for you know yeah, yeah. and um so why why does the coral i mean i don't have vegetables growing inside my tissues why does the coral have essentially vegetables growing inside its yeah. tissue and that's what i guess makes coral so incredibly interesting as well for for scientists is that it's an animal but it has all these algae inside so it can both capture f food in the water column and feed itself from that but it also has these algae through which it can photosynthesize and so much of the energy requirements actually come from these algae um, and so corals are really dependent on light, at least the ones on tropical coral reefs. Tropical coral reefs dependent on light. Amazing. So that's very, very cool. So it's a rock-like skeleton yeah. with an animal on the outside with a vegetable on the inside. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what an incredible living thing. And, um, but we're, we're, as you mentioned before, we're, we're in the tropics. We're on an island, the island of Curaçao. Um, but we're not just anywhere. We're, we're at a, a, a research station. Yeah. And this is probably not the first research station you visited. Just can we just give an idea of, of what a why are field research stations important? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And I mean, because obviously if you visit a coral reef, there's all these dive shops and you can go diving and you can see the reef. But really to do science, you need the support on land with a laboratory where you can run experiments, where you can measure things. And that's why research stations are really important because they have the re coral reef right next door. But then when you collect samples, you can take them inside, look at them, assess them. And, yeah. So you've got a science lab, sort of a little bit of like a souped up version of what you might have in a school or a university. But exactly. that, that kind of thing here right next yeah. to the reef. So you've got that interaction. Ah, 
And it's amazing. So in the morning, you're like underwater collecting samples. And then a couple hours later, you're just in the lab with all the chemicals and reagents running the experiments. So. Brilliant. Um, so th thank you very much for that introduction because that sort of kind of situates where we are yeah. and, 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 and the sort of the animal that we're, we're talking about. I I'm, first met you on Heron Island when you were involved in a project called the XL Catlin Sea View Survey. Yeah. What was that about and what was your role? Yeah, so that was a really interesting and very ambitious project that we, uh, that we were both uh, involved in. And basically the goal was to sort of produce this global survey of coral reefs um, and so we partnered up with Google as well um, because we had seen this street view thing yeah. that they have where you can just go anywhere in the world you can drop a pin and you can look around um, what the streets look like and and so we worked with someone Richard Vivers who came up with the idea of like why are we doing this underwater and so that was our goal to basically pr produce this underwater street view um, um, but at the same time, we also wanted to do a lot of science, um, given that we'd be out on a boat and visiting all these coral reefs. And so we basically had a team looking at shallow reefs and a team looking at deep reefs. And so I was leading the team um, looking at deep reefs and doing all the deep reef science. Um. And, and what, what, do we, what do we mean by deep reef? I mean, because yeah. I mean, we got, I mean I, someone said to me, you get corals down to 3,000 meters. Yeah, Is that's right. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so when we talk about deep reefs, we mean basically the deeper end of a tropical coral reef. Okay. So let's say coral reefs usually extend down to about 100 meters depth. Um, and so it's that deeper from like 30, 40 meters depth onwards down to 100 or maybe 150 meters. And so we're still dealing with light dependent corals, corals like photosynthesize, uh, but yeah, the deeper health. And then on the other end, we have these deep sea corals. Ah, okay. And they can occur much, much deeper, to several kilometers deep, and they don't occur just in the tropics, but you can find them in Norway, or, um, and they are what we call cold water reefs. So the water temperature is a lot colder, but they're also, they don't have any light or very little light. And so those corals actually don't have those um, symbiotic algae. They don't have those vegetables inside. Um, Amazing. So we've got so all the way down to so so many of the countries we're talking about. Sort of, you know, there's, there's a school in Scotland there, and they have yeah. quite famous Lophelia yeah. reefs off off the Hebrides. So it's, it's it's not just the tropical yeah. areas that the coral grows, but we're we're talking specifically about the, um, the the deeper reef. And what what interests you about the deep reef? Because it's, it doesn't get quite so much. Um, Sort of, you know, media attention. It's sort of. It's yeah. normally we get the shallower, sort of, you know, all the different animals and everything else. But what, what's interesting about the, that deeper bit of the reef? Well, what's very interesting, first of all, is that we just know so little about these reefs, and that's for a good reason. In that they're actually quite difficult to research. So, using regular scuba equipment, we can go to 30 meters or 100 feet quite easily. But if you want to go below that, we need special diving equipment or we need robots. And so what you usually get is that either we're focusing on very shallow reefs or when we have, you know, access to equipment like a submersible or something, we go and look as deep as we can. And so there's this sort of intermediate depth zone, the twilight zone, or we call it the mesophotic zone, that's really understudied. And so that's one reason that we know very little about it. Um, but one reason why I got really interested in these deeper reefs or twilight reefs is the fact that there's a lot of disturbances that seem to affect shallow reefs but not necessarily affect deeper reefs. Okay. And so we've been wondering to what extent these deeper reefs are actually a refuge. And so whether they, you know, protect the reef from disturbances, it might actually be really ecologically important. So I think, I mean, disturbances, is, that's quite a science word. Yeah. You, you know, what, 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 I mean, for our younger students, what, what are we meaning by disturbances? If we've got sort of like a shallower reef, so say 0 to 30 meters, yeah. what kind of things might be happening to that bit of the reef? Yeah. Yeah, so, so one thing is, for example, um, storms or hurricanes, they come through and, you know, they destroy our rooftops and houses, and, but they also uh, cause really large waves, which can actually damage the coral. Like, for example, branching coral in the shallow is quite delicate, which normally is not a problem, but if you get really big waves, it might break them. I, mean, I think we can see there's a lot of branching coral rubble out here, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, our whole beach is the, the, the whole thing. Uh, yeah. And, and so that storm events, the other obviously is our warming oceans and that's a really, really big problem uh, because corals are actually really quite finicky when it comes to their temperature. Um, 
So like even the, the thermostat needs to be just right. Just right. And I guess it's similar with us too, right? Like if our body temperature increases with one or two degrees Celsius, that, that's an issue too, right? We have a fever. I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd have a fever. And I think that's, that's, I mean, that's a very interesting for me comparison between terrestrial and marine biology yeah. and science is that because marine life is surrounded by water with its sort of higher specific heat capacity or, mm. you know, it takes it's much more energy to to maintain that the levels that you like yeah no totally and uh, as we you know we can regulate temperature but most organisms in the ocean are just directly dependent on the temperature of, of the so, sea yeah we can sweat a little bit just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to keep ourselves cool uh, and i think we've got some um photographs um and we've got one of some some fans and yeah. deep sea fans and and we've got one of some um deep sea coral if we look at the fans first, I mean, yeah. what, 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 what can we sort of see on, on what, what are we seeing that's different from maybe shallower, sh shallower areas? Yeah, so on the deep reef we actually find a, l a lot more sea fans than we, uh, than we find in the shallow. And they are actually really good at capturing plankton and stuff in the water, basically. And so what you often see is that you get these large fans, but they angle themselves in such a way that they capture the current. And so we often get a lot of what we call upwelling, which is water that comes from the deep sea and that's being pushed up the reef into the shallow. And so they angle the cells in such a way that they can capture much of these particles coming through. And that's what, what they feed on. The really, so so that, that's really not relying on the photosynthesis, but really relying on, on, on those, those particles or plankton coming up from, yeah. from the deep ocean. Mostly, yeah. And I think we've also got uh, a photograph of some sort of uh, plate coral, sort of darker plate coral from the deep reef. So yeah. what, what, what's, what's, um, what's going on with that one? Yeah, and that's, that's one of the, the most interesting things that you will note. So if you would dive in and you go for a dive and you look at the shallow reef, you see all these different what we call growth forms, so different shapes like branching, you think big boulders and but as you go down the reef slope if, as you swim down first thing you'll notice obviously that you get a lot less light it becomes darker and darker but not just darker it also becomes more blue all the other colors slowly disappear until you just have this blue so it's sort of blue darkish and then what you see happen to the corals is that they slowly become flatter and flatter and then when you're really on the deep reef you just get these flat plates and that's because there's so little light that they try to capture as much as they can. So they form these like dishes to basically a, capture everything. It's a bit like a sort of solar panels down yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. And, and is, is uh, because we've, we've seen here on, on the piles, um, just on the jetty, that we've seen that, that maize and brain coral, which is quite a pale color. Yeah. But the photograph, I think we, I don't know, we're still showing it, is that it's quite a dark um, color. Is, is there a reason for uh, the coral being darker at depth? Yeah, so they're just back. I mean, they either have more of these algae or the algae that they have have more of the chlorophyll, which is what they use for photosynthesis. And that just becomes denser and denser to capture all the last bit of light that's still there. And so they, they look really brown. Yeah. Amazing. So you've got that adaptation to the environmental conditions. And we did an experiment just before where we're looking at the relationship between light um, and depth. And amazing, you know, just think that I think it's just 10 meters, you have half the amount of available light than, yeah. you, do at, than you do at the surface. Yeah. So they're doing an amazing amount of work yeah. to capture that. And that available light, does that mean that your deeper corals grow slower? Well, that's what we initially thought. So we initially thought they, they must be growing slower because there's less light. But what happens is that these corals, these plates, they're actually very, very thin, very fragile. It only takes like a little flick and you can actually break them apart. And so if you just look at the surface area, they don't necessarily grow slower, but they obviously, they deposit a lot less of this, 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 this yeah. calcium carbonate, this rock this, substrate. Yeah. And that's how they can still sort of grow at similar speeds, but they obviously deposit less, they don't form reefs like they do in the shallow. And that's really interesting because we're, we're coming back to what you're talking about earlier is that we've talked about the shallow reef and the deep reef as though there were two separate places. Mm. Is, is, is that the case or is there a sort of a gradual change as you go down the slope? There's definitely a gradual change and that also has a lot to do with a lot of the changes we see are in response to light and that's, that's gradual. And so this transition is also quite gradual. So if you would go to a very shallow depth, let's say 10 meters and you go to 80 meters depth, they look very, very different, but there is definitely sort of this gradual twain ch change in between. Uh, 
I mean, this this change, and I just want to come back to the comment you made about um, what you termed refuge. Yeah. Now, many students around the world may have seen uh, the, the the coral bleaching, the mass mm. bleaching events um, in the news and in the media. It's, it's quite been being, yeah. being quite well reported. Um, briefly, what is bleaching, and how does it affect different parts of the, yeah. the reef? And so coral bleaching happens when the temperatures get too warm, um, too warm for the algae basically. And so the algae actually, they don't, um, they don't effectively photosynthesize anymore, they don't provide energy to the coral. And so when that lasts too long, when those hot temperatures are there too long, the coral actually expels these algae yeah. and loses them. But by doing so, it also loses the ability to photosynthesize. And so the coral then is exclusively lying on feeding from the water column and so it can survive and it depends on species how long they can survive but if that lasts too long it will eventually die and so that's what we see a lot when we get these warm water of warm water events that last a month two months three months we just lose a lot of coral from this, this coral bleaching and is that affecting the, the the deeper reef as well is that warm water getting down down yeah. deep so that's a that's a really good question and that sort of really depends on, on where you look and on the local ocean conditions. So in a lot of areas we get this sort of upwelling events in summer which actually bring cold water to, to the deeper reef. And so with the Great Barrier Reef where we saw a lot of the damage being reported yeah. of the, this coral bleaching, what we actually saw was that the deep reef initially was protected from the bleaching because of this upwelling. But then later on into the year this upwelling all of a sudden stopped and temperatures even on the deep reef um, rose up and were way warmer than normal. And so what we saw was that in the end, there was damage on the deep reef too, all the way down. We looked down to 40 meters, 130 feet, but it was less than in the shallow. No. And, and you, you know, you, you've got damage going all the way down. Some places it's not so damaged. Some places there's no damage at all on the deep no. reef. You're talking, and you use this word refuge. Does that mean that the corals can kind of hide out in the deep and then come back to the shallow? Yeah, so that, that's sort of a hypothesis that we've been working on um, for a while to figure out whether that's true, that when you get a... Um, something happening like a storm or warm water event, the deep reefs are not as affected. Okay, so they, you know, they've survived. But then what happens? Can they actually help produce coral babies that settle in the shallow or not? And so that's that's something that we've been looking a lot. And for that, we actually have to use genetics because we can't track the individual larvae on the reef. I wish we could because then we could just see where do they go, where do they then settle and form new coral colonies. Um, but, but that's just impossible. And so we use genetic techniques to actually figure out whether the ones that show up in the shallow are relatives of the ones in the deep, and so figure out th those connections that way. And do, do we have this grand, you know, this, this is a hypothesis, which is a you know, great thing, you know, yeah. students, students will be developing their own hypothesis or, or testing those themselves. Yeah. This is a hypothesis that you have, that yeah. you know, the deep reef can help to repopulate the shallow reef. Yeah. What is the evidence showing? And so the evidence that showing that <laughs> it depends, <laughs> which actually happens quite a bit in science. But basically, the, the short of the story is that for some corals, there's definitely that potential because they seem to form one single population over depth and just exchange coral larvae, coral babies between shallow, between deep. And so they have great potential to actually help in the recovery of shallow reefs. But then we've also found a lot of other species that are actually genetically very distinct in the shallow and the deep. So they're the same coral species, but the actual populations are so different that they're not actually exchanging anymore. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, so there is some hope in some places that yeah. even if the shallow reef is affected by these disturbances, so the bleaching and storms, yeah. then the deep reef can kind of help out. Yeah. I mean, it's the, I've, just to say, we've, we've, got, we've got a lot of questions coming through from schools, so I'd just like to love to di dive into some of those now. Um, and just before we start, a big shout out to Carmel College in, in Darlington in the UK. But coming back, and I think this is really interesting for the students watching, is it may not have been told that you, you, can, you, can, you can visit tropical coral reefs as a job in science. Yeah. So how, 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 do, you, how do you get into this work? Yeah, how do you get into this work? So I obviously got into this work by being really interested in biology. But I actually started off um, studying tropical rainforests. Did you? Yeah, and so uh, I actually ended up going, um, so I, I had several years of subjects and learning all about train, tropical rainforest, uh, what they call ecology. Um, and then I visited Costa Rica, actually, and uh, was in a rainforest for several months. 
Um, but they also, people were diving there and there was a really famous research station close by from, uh, from the Smithsonian in the US. And so I saw all these people doing underwater research and I got really intrigued. And so I got my scuba diving ticket, which uh -huh. I guess is sort of the first step in becoming a marine biologist, right? Because you obviously need to find some sort of way of actually going on on the water. Well, I mean, I mean, having said that, marine biologists for working in, in, in the, the Arctic, you can yeah. do that from a boat. That's true. That's very true. Tropical. No, it's very true. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, that's where it, for me, really sort of started. Um, yeah. I mean, and so, so what, you're studying hard at, um, at science at school, doing an undergraduate doesn't have to be marine biology or marine science it can just no. be sort of biology or natural sciences and then looking at specializing um, after that I mean the masters and the doctorate and these types of things how, how does that work after you've got your first degree yeah what what happened do you how many steps are there yeah, to, yeah. to where you are now and so um, and so it depends a little bit in which country you are but um, generally there is um, so you're doing your undergraduate degree and then after that, you get the opportunity through a, an honors degree or a master's degree to really sort of develop your own research project and do that for one or two years and really get the taste of what it is to do to do science. And so you do that. And then once you've done that, you, you do what, what's called a PhD, where you really you spend four years or up to six years really honing in in a particular, like broader question that you try to answer and you specialize. And then once you've done that, you get your doctor's degree and you're sort of generally seen as a scientist. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then and then you start working as a scientist. But then there is still that what they call postdoctoral research fellowships, which is sort of a form of training still until you eventually get to a professor or senior scientist level. Senior scientist level where you are with your yeah. congratulations on your new post in California. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, going back to... A lot of people have said that, you know, I was doing something, I was doing biology, I was doing rainforest, and then I, then I went and I saw a coral reef for the first time. Yeah. And from that moment on, I knew. Yeah. What is it about that? Did you have one of those moments? And what is it about that moment that was so powerful? Yeah. Well, I think for me, I always imagined, like I was always intrigued by rainforest because I was like, there's so much diversity, there's so much life. But to be honest, when I actually visited the rainforest, it really surprised me that you really have to go look for the life, even in rainforest. You hear all the sounds, but it's not like everything is right there. And so that was one of the things when I actually went on a dive. Um, on a coral reef, life is just everywhere. It's literally in your face. And it's, it's just like, you know, Times Square, right? Like it's, it's super busy. It's just everywhere. It's almost a bit overwhelming, but that's what really sort of got to me. And that's why I got so interested in yeah. Amazing. And so how, how long has it been from that moment till now? How long have you been working on, on, on the reef for? That's a good question. <laughs> I think, yeah, 15 years now. Yeah. 15 years since I yeah, made that switch from tropical rainforest to marine biology. So 15 years into your science sort of career, your reef career, you're, you've now got, got a new position in California. What, what do you hope to achieve through your research? Yeah, so I think initially when I was interested in coral reefs, it was really from a, what we call a fundamental perspective. So really just trying to learn and understand how things work and just like generally being you know, interested in that. Um, but I think gradually that's also changed a little bit more for me just because we see all this damage to coral reefs. And especially like for the past, um, past 10 years, I've been working on the Great Barrier Reef. And so I, as a coral reef biologist, I always learned about bleaching and how bad it is for reefs. And, and I'd seen, you know, bits and pieces of it. But I always thought like something like the Great Barrier Reef, which is 2,300 kilometers long. I was like, intuitively, I was like, you know, that should be strong enough to deal with these kind of things. And so two, three years ago, we had a big bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef because of these warmer temperatures. And we were actually out there surveying the, the damage. And that really got to me because we basically, we went for a dive and then went back on the boat and we were sailing for hundreds of kilometers, jumped back in the water. And every time we did that, it was just fields of, of white corals just looking like this so that we're on their way out. And so that really, really got to me. And, um, and that also made me change a little bit more um, my research path too, that I, I want to be, you know, contributing to solutions and not just documenting this decline and and being sad about it, but also, you know, figure out ways what we can do for coral reefs. And, and that's great. And that, that's, that's, you know, starting up and hopefully, you know, when we talk to you over, over the next two years, I hope a few years, 
finding out about what those solutions are and how yeah. your research can start to inform. Yeah. I, I, do you have any answers yet? Or, do, any... Or, 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 or are we, should we should ask, ask you again next year? <laughs> well, the problem is there's not going to be like a, a silver bullet, right, that will, that will fix it all. So I think that the answer is really in having all these, first of all, getting a better understanding of, yeah. of you know, how these corals respond to warmer temperatures. And there's a lot of natural variation, just like we all look different and, right, like there's all these differences between us. Similarly, corals, even from a single species, they respond differently to warmer temperatures and, and better understanding that and better understand how we can protect that, I think, would be, be key. I mean, it's really interesting you talk about the diversity in corals and there's a question just coming in, which is, I think, just clarifying um, about primary producers on, on the reef. And I know that corals are in a fun, funny position in that. Yeah. When, when students are studying sort of biology on land which is yeah. most of, mostly on, you know for whatever reason our you know countries around the world decided that land-based biology is what students should start with yeah there's only one type of really one type of um, living thing they're studying and I'm waving at trees yeah. that that photosynthesizes that takes the energy from the Sun yeah in the marine environment there's all these different range of ways that living yeah. things are getting energy from them what's how 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 does um how do these different so how is the algae different from the seaweed the macro algae different from the bacteria different from the algae in the different from the seagrass of plants how are all these things different in, yeah. in the sea this was just a really interesting no 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 totally and and that's what's so uh, what's so interesting too because it all occurs right next to each other and you get these so seaweed and seagrass that are that are just photosynthesizing, just like plants on land, basically. But then you have all the, the phytoplankton in the water that photosynthesize and are dependent on the light. But then you have the what we call the zooplankton, so the animal plankton that then feeds on the phytoplankton. And we have corals, which have the algae inside. And jellyfish the and anemones, so the variety of animals that exactly. have algae. The anemones too, that's right. And then we have sponges that capture a lot of the, the particulate matter, like the particles in the water column and the dissolved um, substances that they then filter and recycle into the coral reef and so so really I mean just the difference between a lot of these is 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 the tax you know the, the different tax the taxonomy and the sort of different kingdoms are really yeah. um, but often they're providing the same functions so yeah. the the the, um, the sort of algae inside the coral tissue and seagrass are performing the same function so far as they're taking energy from the sun yeah. and making it available to other... Yeah, and they make habitat for fish, right? Seagrass, because the fish can hide in between it and then there's all kinds of stuff growing on the fish. And then the corals, because they deposit this rock and so they form these big reef structures um, that also, uh, they don't just provide protection for fish, but also for us, because they actually protect our coastline really? against waves. So, yeah, Very cool. that's one of the important functions for reefs too. Um, you spoke about, you know, about the mass bleaching events. Is there an idea about how fast the reef is being damaged and, and how long do we have before it's all gone? Yeah, well, so how fast it's happening, we know that we lost about health, health of our corals in the world over the past 30 years, generally, um, which is a lot. And if you just look at the Great Barrier Reef, the Great Barrier Reef is so large that it's divided into these different sections. What we found in this last, this last event that on the northern Great Barrier Reef was similar. We lost about half of the corals. So I'd say reefs are changing fast, right? Like there's a, there's a lot of damage. Um, but I don't think we'll lose our reefs. I'm very hopeful that they, they will be there. They might look different, mm -hmm. but they will be there. They will, they'll find a way. They might change. But our job really is, I think, to make sure that they don't change too much. And then more importantly, that they, that they maintain their function to us and, you know, to all the, the inhabitants. Um. And it, 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 is there a set of choices that we have? We're, we're talking to, to Rene last week mm. and he was talking about some of the modelling work that's done. Yeah. You know, if the global temperatures increase by one and a half degrees, yeah. what will happen? Two and a half, what will happen? Four and a half, yeah. what will happen? It, I mean, th th those are choices that we're, we're making. Totally, totally, yeah. And they're directly dependent on how we all behave, and right? And it goes from the little things to, you know, if, if it's a sunny day and you're washing your clothes, 
yeah, you can put it in a dryer, but it costs a lot of energy. We could also put it out on, you know, clothesline outside and let the sun do its work. And it's all these little changes that if, if we all make those changes, we can all contribute to <laughs> <laughs> slowing that rapid rise in temperature. Um, so, so work to be done. I mean, it, it is, I mean, the Paris Agreement, I think, that's come through on, on climate change, limiting yeah. us to one, one and a half degrees, we, the coral reef might not change too, too much. Yeah. I think even with <laughs> one and a half degrees, like we will sti still see this. Um, I mean, we're seeing the problem is not so much. I mean, coral reefs always have had storms, right? That basic part. But the big problem is that these disturbances, whether it's storms or you know high temperatures, are becoming too frequent, so too quickly in a row. And so normally, if you get a storm, if a reef gets 23 of 20 to 30 years to recover and grow back, it will actually be in the same state, it'll be fine. But if those disturbances just keep coming really quickly after each other, that's, that's when they get in trouble. And it's, um, looking at that also, is, is thinking about the other impacts that might slow the, that recovery rate, such as pollution yeah. or overfishing and, and, and those types of things. Yeah. So we're not helping in, in lots of different ways. No. <laughs> well, we will, right? We will, we, we, will. Will. <laughs> we will, and our audience will as well. Um, and a question sort of what has been your proudest discovery if 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 you're if you because i think there is a there's a sense that uh scientists have eureka moments so you've just find the thing yeah. um has, has that happened to you well yeah maybe not in a in an individual moment but i think also and i think also important to point out is that like science is often a team exercise, right? Yeah. Like there's often a spotlight on an individual scientist, but in the end, we're all working together to be able to do it. And I think my proudest achievement as a, as a team of you know, different research working together is really putting a, a spotlight on the deep reefs of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, like 10 years ago, there was only like a handful of studies that looked into the deep reefs. And we've actually really contributed to a better understanding of what these twilight zone reefs on the Great Barrier Reef what kind of species do you find there? What's their general ecology? What are the environmental conditions? And, and then you've, have you found new species down there? Yeah, we found new species of coral. And wow. there's, uh, by my colleagues, there's a lot of uh, new species of fish basically discovered every time they go on an expedition. So oh, really? it's, uh, it's a really a frontier uh, for um, biodiversity uh, research. And is that one of your favorite things? I mean, this is a question sort of, you know, coming in from a student, what is your favorite thing about being a research scientist? Yeah. I think it's discovery in general, not so much discovery new species, which is always really exciting, particularly if it's a really nice looking, right? Like <laughs> yeah. species of Rather than a sort of, sort of blobby sort of blobby worm. And well, and that's what happens most of the time. So there's these slight differences that, you know, make it into a different species, but it's not like, wow. But no, the, the most exciting thing is just the discovery, that just having these, um, yeah, fossils to solve, basically. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's something that's, that's come up a lot is, is that there's sort of two things from, from a lot of scientists here, one of which is, is cur curiosity, how important yeah. that is. And the second one is you've got to love solving puzzles. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and sort of the bigger puzzles to solve, but also practical. Like as a marine biologist, it's really hands-on. You have boats that all of a sudden don't work, you have to fix, you have equipment that breaks, you have to quickly come up with it. There's a lot of MacGyvering, uh, basically. Yeah, I think we've put on Twitter today the, the, this, this um, wonderful, of course, you know, uh, production um, yeah. tent, which are readily available on Curacao. It yeah. uh, didn't have to be MacGyvered at all um, by Ellie uh, through, the, through the night to make sure that even when it's been showering this morning, yeah. we've been able to broadcast. Um, <laughs> If Dr. Pim yes. could talk about one thing on coral reefs, what would it be? What, what, what should everybody know? What could be one thing? Well, I think, I mean, a lot of people always point out to me, it's like, why should we care about coral reefs? You know, there are only, I think it's less than 1% of the, the surface of the earth. So yeah. why should we care yeah. about it? But I think it's really important to remember that it's still like a sixth of our world's coastline. There's 500 million people that are dependent for food and livelihood directly on coral reefs, which is huge. It's 25% of all marine species occur on coral reefs. Um, and we've estimated with all this kind of modeling and that it must be like about $300 billion a year. I mean, the um, latest estimates I've seen are up to a trillion. I mean, the, the Costanza yeah. paper, I think, it's just, it's just bonkers. No, it's not bonkers. It just I mean, I mean, it, I mean, what, what you, I mean um, it's bonkers to, to, to think that if you look at, you compare the GDP of, you know, 
yeah. the ecosystem, you know, production in terms of money, that it's 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 you know more than France, Germany, the UK yeah. put together for coral reefs. I Which mean, it's it, crazy. But at the same time, it's also like, can you like, it's good to put a value on it because some people need to see money values, right, to, to sort of convey the importance. But you know, like, do we even need to put money on it? It's something so so special like we want to preserve it right regardless of how much money we might get out of it it's something we don't want to lose just like tropical rainforest uh, i think um, I mean, it, it's um, we're getting into a, a quite uh, an interesting area of discussion here which is about this what we're calling ecosystem goods and services yeah. and that being okay if it's a coral reef then it provides food because there's fish yeah. um, living there it provides coastal protection because you're saying the storms coming in can yeah. be protected by the reef. Uh, it can provide money for jobs, especially the tourism industry. Yeah. And you're saying, okay, so one way of looking at the natural world is what yeah. it can do for us, but we sh that's not the only way yeah. we should look at it. I think so, yeah. And op opinions differ, right? But I, I definitely think there's more. Like we can't express it like a human, a human life. We don't put a value per se on that, right? Like, so similarly, should we put a value on, on coral reefs? Uh, and this is, this is going back to so what you're talking about, is like what might the future reef um, be looking like? Um, how, how, how in, in, so we've got um, young people who, who, who you know, may be becoming researchers in sort of 5, 10, 15 years time, might be sort of getting their doctorates. Yeah. Um, what do you think the reef will look like for them? And I don't know, it's, it's, it's something yeah. that, you know, away from the science, because I know that, you know, you don't want to be sort of you know, held to things, but it's sort of in your imagination. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that they, they look very similar to what <laughs> they look today. And we have seen, so there's two sides of the story. Since I've been coming here for about 15 years in Curacao, and the reef now, today, looks different from 15 years ago. Um, mostly, there's just a lot more algae on the reef. And is that all the way around the island? Because I know that some areas of the island are affected yeah. by different stresses. It's exactly. And so there's I parts of the island that are, um, where there's no development on land, there's no buildings, there's no... And so they actually, like on the east side of the island, still look very similar. They've also changed a bit because um, a lot of it has to do, the increase in algae has to do with runoff, so nutrients from land coming into the water. And that's things from farming to sewage to yeah, everything. Yeah, exactly. And so, so, yes, one part of the story is that the reef already looks quite different. 15 years ago, there's a lot more algae. But we're also seeing really hopeful things around the reefs in Curacao. Reefs that have been damaged by a storm really have come back really nicely. And, and so I remain hopeful that, that it won't look too different in 15 years' time from now. Wow. Um, just a, a, nice, a nice couple of questions to... To, to bring bring us towards the close, very sadly. Um, what is your what's your favourite place to go diving? My favourite place to go diving, I think Curacao is actually my favourite yeah, place really? to go diving. There's something really special um, about the reefs here. One being that they're just right there. So on the Great Barrier Reef, if we go and um, we lo look at deep reefs, we actually have to go really far by boat. So sometimes we travel two days on a boat to get to the reef. And so all of the research is actually done fr from the boat. We, don't, we cannot use a research station um, w when we look at those deeper reefs. But here, you just walk into the ocean, you go down, and the reef just goes down, 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 all the way to several hundred meters depth. And so for someone studying deep reefs, this is the perfect place, you right? You just, just walk. Yeah. Walk, walk to the deep reef and then walk back to the, 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 the lab again. Yeah. Uh, that, that's... that's pretty special yeah I just 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 on you know talk talking about you know pick Curacao maybe one of the most famous reefs um, in the world Great Barrier Reef yeah. a question coming through asking how long how long would it take to form a reef as big as the Great Barrier Reef yeah how long does it take so, there, so there's been corals in that area for a long long time like hundreds and thousands of years but we know that the current structure what we currently call the Great Barrier Reef um, is it between five and ten thousand years old? So I think you know that's how long we take to really build up. 
and then the it's building up that but um were that to die you're saying you were talking before about sort of oh. the period needed to grow back because it's sort of like 20 25 years or yeah, yeah or 20 maybe to 30 years we generally say but that obviously is dependent also that there's enough coral around in neighboring areas that can help help that recovery because if it would really get wiped out and there's nothing left it wouldn't be able to recover right like it's dependent on in, on areas that still survive them. Okay. Yeah, that's that's um, so hope, but uh, but it's a little bit of a bleak <laughs> message there. But just just to end off, we were talking before uh, a little bit about uh, diving, yeah, deep diving, deep diving. Uh, and, and we you you mentioned a, a couple of things that I know have, have come up in an earlier conversation. How deep do you dive and what are some of the problems that you might face down there? Yeah, so the biggest limitation of doing, doing research on these deeper reefs is that if you go deeper than like 30 meters or 100 feet, you only get very, very limited time and then you have to commit to what's called decompression, which basically means that on the way up you have to make all these stops. You cannot go directly to the surface area anymore. So normally when we do scientific diving, we make sure that we stay within that limit so that if something goes wrong, we can always slowly swim back to the surface. If you stay longer or you go deeper, you don't have this option anymore. And so you have to take all these extra tanks of air and special gas mixes to be able to slowly come up. And so that's the, so that's the bigger uh, limitation there. And have you had any frightening experiences when you know, air has been at a, a premium? No, no, because we do make sure that like those kind of dives are planned very well and uh, we plan all the kind of emergencies that might happen um, to just have, yeah, so basically you carry all this emergency gas that if something goes wrong that you have enough, but then you also make sure you always dive with someone that again has that emergency supply. And we actually do a whole lot of training. So part of doing, being a marine biologist and working on deep reefs means that Every year you have to sort of refresh all that training and all those skills to be able to dive deep and handle and those you, situations. And you were out here doing something called rebreather training? Was that? Yeah. What, what's what's rebreather? So basically, um, so we can use regular scuba tanks and regulators to go quite deep, to go to about 40, 50 meters. But below that we have to use this special gas called helium. And if we don't, we basically get a very drunk feeling. So if you use regular scuba air and you go to 40 meters and deeper, you get really drunk on the water, which obviously is a bit dangerous, yes. right? And so what you can do is actually put helium into your gas mixture, which is a lighter gas, but long story short, it just takes away that drunken feeling. The only issue is that this helium is extremely expensive. And so if you would fill up two scuba tanks, you could pay several hundred dollars just to go for one dive. And so what we use is a machine called a rebreather, which actually, um, normally when you, breathe through a normal scuba regulator, all the air you breathe out just become the bubbles, bu bubbles that you straight see, to the yeah. surface. A rebreather, it actually gets captured and it gets recycled. So it's basically like a vacuum cleaner hose that runs all the way around. <laughs> and so you just breathe out and it goes to what we call uh, a scrubber, which takes out all of the CO2 that we respire. Mm -hmm. Then it measures how much oxygen is in this, this, what we call the loop. And then it just injects little bits of oxygen. So you have a tank with pure oxygen, which is only this big. But it allows you to stay on the water for like six hours six in a hours. tiny little scuba bottle. And it allows you to go much deeper because it doesn't matter. How, normally on scuba, the deeper you go, the faster you will go through the air because it gets compressed down. On the rebreather, that's not, that's not the case. And you can actually spend six hours on the water. Uh, I mean, uh, amazing adventures to be had on the water. Yeah. Um, Pim, thank you so much uh, for being part of Axa Coral Live. It's been great to catch up with you yeah, and hear, really hear, right. hear about all your um, adventures to hear about the hope yeah. that you have for, for the reef uh, amid all this uh so doom and gloom that we see yeah. see see in, in in the medias and and great to hear about the fascinating ad adventures and research that you've had studying the the deep reef so thank yeah. you so much for no, being no, part of, so of coral life for having me um we have a sponge special um, ask me anything coming up in 45 minutes so do tune back in for that and then we have our three sessions again repeated for our schools in the Americas this afternoon so that's a live investigation going deeper looking at the relationship between depth pressure and depth and light uh, then Pim you're coming back um, to join us and uh, to talk again about your experiences um, in the twilight zone mm. and then we have a second sponge special um, to, to cap off 
uh, the day. Come back as well on Thursday when we have sessions on adaptation. But thank you so much for joining us at the Kamabi Research Station in Curacao. But it's goodbye for now. Bye-bye.